Um, we opened up about the 11 slots, and also uh, some of you have sent me email about getting into the class. So uh, we should be able to accommodate everyone in the next few days. And um, uh, hey, how many of you have been able to log into WebGPU? Good. How many of you are still waiting for WebGPU credentials? We'll, we'll clear you up today. So uh, do you know how to send email to Andy Xu? Uh, it's in the slides. OK. So uh, if you don't, just send it to me uh, forward. That uh, Some of you are still being cleared up. So the, you should be getting credentials today, the latest. OK. A um, couple other things. Uh, one is that um, uh, for those of you who, uh, who are waiting for the videos, uh, we're still waiting for the engineering IT to post uh, to us the week, uh, video link. So we'll put them into the wiki link. But um, if you have Echo 360, at some point the video should, should, uh, should begin to show up too. So you should be able to view the video from both the wiki side and the Echo 360 side. Okay. Um, uh, some of you also ask uh, whether or not you need to view the previous semester video before class. Um, some students find it useful. That's why we, we make that available, but you don't have to. But definitely review um, the uh, book chapters after the lecture because the lectures are, and the book chapters are complementary. Okay? And uh, I'm not going to cover everything in the book chapter in the lectures. You are here not for me to, not to listen to me to repeat everything we said about the textbook. Okay, you should be getting something additional from these lectures. So I'm going to emphasize certain things that we did not emphasize in the textbook, and there are certain things that are actually a little more fun uh, when you listen to someone talking about it. So we, you know, I'll have a little bit different emphasis in the lectures. So, but the textbook chapter really covers all the important details for you to be able to do well when you program and so on. So you really should treat these two as complementary items and you know, do both. Okay? And um, it really will be helpful if you read the textbook chapter before you, uh, you finish your coding. Okay? It really will help you. Okay? Any uh, quick questions? If you ask any questions in this classroom, um, you need to do me a favor and ask me to repeat the question because uh, the Chicago Scholar students cannot hear your question. So the, if I go ahead and answer your question without repeating your question, yell at me. Someone yell at me and say, hey, you know what, uh, Chicago, and then I will repeat your question, okay? So um, we, are, we were here, and I'll just quickly finish a few slides that we did not finish uh, from the previous lecture. We're going to be talking about uh, you know, managing very large amount of parallelism in the code. Um, the truth of the matter is, unless you have a, a fairly large amount of parallelism and um, you want to be able to get through the computation very quickly, um, it's really not worthwhile to do, uh, to do parallel programming. If you're only writing code to have two-way parallelism, four-way parallelism, chances are the overhead for coordinating parallelism will eat up the, uh, any potential benefit. So the kind of things that you will be doing in parallel programming will be massively parallel. And in real world, there are many, many applications that do have massive parallelism. That's the reason why you're here. Okay? We have a lot of real applications that can truly be programmed in a massive parallel uh, manner. So if we look at any kind of human experience in managing massive parallelism, Computer science is not the only discipline or computer engineering. Uh, you know, for the rest of the world, by the way, computer science and computer engineering, people don't know the difference. To be, I'm, very, I'm being recorded. OK, uh, sorry about that. Um, so for the rest of the world, people view us as a single discipline. And main, there are many, many other disciplines. You know, the transportation, okay, the military, and uh, these are very different disciplines, but they all have managed massive parallelism in history. And they also have a lot of experience that we can benefit from. If you look at the top of the slide, the Navy, the Army, and the transportation system all have been you know, 
dealing with massive amount of traffic, a massive amount of movement of equipment and organization through the history, right? So, you know, if you look at any of these things, you will realize that the first important item for managing massive parallelism is regularity, okay? If you want to be able to move a whole fleet of vessels through the ocean, you need to have a good formation. And we all know that, that when the good formations start to break, bad things happen. You know, we, we have seen the fleet, you know, having, you know, these uh, bad accidents and, you know, sailors got killed and, uh, you know, collision and so on. And so, you know, in the tra traffic, everyone knows that uh, one of the best uh, potential benefit of self-driving cars um, in the next few years is that humans tend to have very, very ba bad behavior in the traffic uh, situation. And it turns out that um, if everyone just slow down a little bit and keep a little bit more distance uh, between cars, the traffic system can actually accommodate probably two times more cars than what we currently can do. It's just that everyone was driving as fast as they can, they don't have keep distance, and so they keep braking, and that actually breaks down the traffic flow. So another you know, the interesting pattern is that if you drive on some of these freeways, such as Los Angeles, such as the Bay Area, the Bay Area has become worse and worse in the past 10 years, 20 years or so. It has to do with economy, you know, when the economy is good, the Bay Area tra traffic is terrible. So I used to, you know, watch the Bay Area traffic every time I go, and then I buy stock and sell stock according to my observations. I did very, very well, by the way. So, uh, so whenever you have a, a heavy traffic system, you see a few of these cars trying to change lane, you know, the, they try to zigzag through the traffic. And that's detrimental, not only to the, uh, to the rest of the cars, but also to the particular car. And you never gain statistically, okay, statistically, you never gain by doing these kind of things because you disturb the regularity of the traffic pattern. Now in the bottom, we have you know, the, uh, the iPhone uh, manufacturing line. And everyone in that picture is doing exactly the same thing. They're you know, doing exactly the same you know, the assembly uh, step. And then uh, you look at the middle. This is the reason why Illinois is so good with parallel process programming and parallel computing. Okay? We know how to massively produce corns <laughs> and soybeans. Okay. And uh, you know, the 1,000 people wedding and so on. So one of the things that um, you know, I, I hope that you realize uh, unfortunately, in your generation, you no longer have this opportunity to really learn from this. Uh, you know, when I was in your age, whenever we fly uh, in these you know, airline flights, they will still serve us food, okay? <laughs> and uh, now you have to buy sandwiches and so on. So in the old days, when you get on the flight, they serve you food, and then they give you a tray, right? They give you a tray of food. Some of you, uh, how many of you have that experience? People actually give you a whole tray of food. You know. uh, do, do you even know the concept of food anymore? Okay, just kidding. So, um, you know, they give you a tray, and that tray has all kinds of things. A tray has salt, a tray has, you know, pepper, that tray has spoon, knife, you know, fork, and everything. And how many of you actually use everything on that tray? Probably no, right? And, but they give you everything there. And the reason is they need to serve you fast, okay? So they don't want to have to ask you, what, do you want salt? Do you want pepper? Do you want fork? Do you want, so by the time they serve the first two rows, the fly has landed, right? So, you know, in order to be able to, to have a massive service, you know, of data items and then have, you know, uh, manage this par parallel, uh, you know, eating, you know, so that you can, they can get everyone to, to eat in parallel, they need to be able to, you know, give you a regular service, okay? They just have everything prepared, and then they just give you, you know, one package every person so that you don't really have a whole lot of customization that, um, you know, that need to be processed. And so we're going to see exactly this in uh, the parallel programming. Whenever threads that are, you know, executing in parallel need to do different things, we start to have a, ph a phenomenon called divergence. Whether it's memory accesses, whether it's, um, you know, control decisions, and these, you know, divergence 
really disturb the execution. And we can tolerate some of those, but we cannot have maximum amount of those. Okay? So you're going to see the regularity as one of the very, very prominent uh, topic in every pattern that we're going to be talking about in parallel programming. The next one is something that is a little bit less glamorous, but everyone will be tripped on this in your career. It's load balancing. So the total amount of time to complete a parallel job is limited by the thread that takes the longest to finish. So if you somehow manage to give too much work to one of the threads, and that thread takes a long time to finish, you're going to start to have very, very bad total execution time because everyone else will be waiting for that, uh, for that thread to finish. So uh, one of the things that I, I learned when I started my teaching career is that um, you know, whenever we grade exams, we try to have every TA to grade uh, all the exams for a particular uh, question just so that we, we can be more fair, right? So, um, so one of the things that uh, always happened you know, in, uh, in the first 10 years of my teaching career is one of the questions would end up being the worst to grade, okay? Much, much worse to grade than others. You will see 50 different answers and then some of them are, you know, should get some partial credit. So some of the professors deal with this by not giving partial credit. Okay, and some of you probably have seen that. And you know what, so for those of you who us are a little bit uh, softy, that we will give partial credit, and then that, that question will take probably five times longer to grade. So you will see that we all finish grading, and one of the poor TAs will be still grading, and still grading, and still grading, and then we go home, and then uh, next morning we come back, and the TA is still grading, still grading. So that's what Low balancing is about, okay? You, you know, whenever you, you start to partition your work into the same, you know, into parallel computing, you need to start to think about, you know, what low imbalancing means. And these things can be very subtle, and, um, you know, I'll come back and talk about it. A lot of times, people can have dramatic load imbalance without even noticing, okay? It has to do with index calculation, it has to do with the regularity of your data structure. So, um, you know, in the end, many, many of us will be tripped by this problem. So I may as well put it up front, and then we keep coming back and revisit, right? Um, so, you know, whenever you have something like this, it's good. Whenever you have something like this, it's bad, okay? So these are the mental images you're going to keep in your, uh, you know, uh, through the semester. Global memory bandwidth. We're going to be processing data, okay? In the end, the compute is only meaningful if it's operating on data, okay? In the end, the information, the data that you, you're able to produce out of your computation is what people want, okay? People don't want computing, okay? Let's face it, you know, we're, we call ourselves computer engineers, computer scientists, we want to be able to do computing. The world actually don't want us, okay? To be honest, they, they, they put up with us. They, what they want is they want to have meaningful data. They want to be able to extract information out of data. So, if, if you do a, you know, a programming and if you do computing, you are going to be processing data and the data cannot happen, just you know, show up automatically. The data has to come from storage. The data has to come from memory. So the ideal mental image that most of us have is something like this. You have the data in the reservoir, and whenever you want data, you open up the floodgate, and the data gush it out, okay? And then uh, you, so you, uh, who, you know, all the data comes in, and then you do all the processing. That's ideally what we want. The truth of the matter is, the data is actually like this. Okay, so if you want data, that straw that you're going to have to suck the data in is called the memory channel, okay? And these things are always, always much, much slower, much, much narrower than you would like to have. And we're gonna you know, show you the numbers through the, uh, you know, the, the next few lectures, and you will see that you know, there's a very good reason why if you just do a naive parallel programming, you're going to get terrible, terrible performance. Because most of the, you know, the very first bottleneck you're going to see 
is going to be how you're going to provide or feed that data to the compute units that are executing your threats. So this is the reason why we cannot teach parallel computing without giving you a little bit of sense of computer architecture. We're not going to be teaching computer architecture in this class, you know, but the computer architecture is well taught in many other classes, 433 in CS, 411 in CE, and so on. You should take those classes. But I would do you a disservice if I did not tell you the most important connections between parallel programming and computer architecture. So, whenever you have conflicting data accesses and or what we call the conflicting updates to your data in memory, you're going to have very interesting and unfortunate serialization and delays. So this is the mental image that uh, you know, I want you to remember. So you have, you know, you, you, whenever you go into these, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, let's say uh, amusement parks, and um, you probably know that uh, you know, you're going to be in line for half an hour if you're lucky, and then uh, two hours if you're not lucky, depending on the ride that you want to take. And the, these rides are fairly, you know, I would say fairly, uh, you know, uh, parallel. You know, uh, every time they have a ride, they will try to get uh, 20 people, 30 people onto the ride. Unfortunately, there are mil you know, hundreds and uh, hundreds of people who want to get on the ride. So you will see this delay and queuing and so on in front of the rides, and then you get two minutes enjoyment out of it, right? So that's, at least you get some enjoyment uh, you know, at the end. If you go to the airport, this is you know, what, you, what you have. You, know, you have these, you know, I would say, you know, very critical resources which are the scanners, okay? The scanners are the critical resources that are limiting your execution rate. And everyone wants to go and be scanned, so they all have conflicting access. If someone is being scanned by a scanner, that scanner cannot scan someone else. So everyone ended up getting queued up. So you have these, you know, people, everything else in the airport is extremely parallel. All the gates are operating in parallel. All the entrances are operating in parallel. This is the, the, the choke point, And this is where everyone has conflicting needs in the processing. Whenever you have a conflicting need in your parallel computing, you're going to see serialization. You're going to see delays. And this is exactly why we teach you know, ways of uh, privatization, and we teach you know, the consequences of atomic operations, why you need them, why you have to avoid them as much as you can if you want performance. So what is at stake here? You know, the stake is that um, you know, for this course, if you come out of this course understanding all the important difficulties and challenges a parallel algorithm need to overcome. And if, you can, if in our generation, we can build a whole collection of scalable algorithms and libraries for the future generations, then we have our legacy. Okay? And this is, we're, we're about 10 years into the parallel computing you know, the revolution. We have a few good libraries, but we're way, ways away from having a good legacy for the future generation. And they will look at our generation and say, these people really, really did us a, a huge favor. They left behind a very extensive library of algorithms and code that we can use to forward science, engineering, you know, and so on, okay, and business. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, just to complete, what we could not cover last week, and uh, we had a little bit of technical difficulty connecting um, the, uh, the laptop. So this time, you know, well, we, uh, we are probably in a slightly catch-up mode, but we should be able to get everyone back on track uh, after today. So with all that introduction, now let's buckle down and begin to work on the sort of the technical uh, aspect of the course. Okay, so hopefully by this time you 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 know you you are a little bit pumped up about uh, you know how useful some of the things that we'll be able to do. And uh, but you know let's get into the sort of the uh, the more uh, concrete technical uh, aspects. So we'll have quite a bit things to do. Um, in one lecture 
I'm really uh, going to try to help you to be able to go into a CUDA environment and being able to write a simple piece of code. There's quite a few things to learn, so buckle down, okay? So we're going to go through those in a reasonably fast pace, but if you have any question, you know, if you want, you want to understand more, raise your hand, okay? So um, the objective of this lecture is for you to learn the basic concept of data parallel computing, okay? And um, uh, CUDA is a data parallel uh, uh, programming model, and uh, to learn the basic features of CUDA C, and in fact, it's becoming CUDA C++ uh, these days. It, uh, it has closed the gap dramatically in, in terms of C++ support. So the kernels are actually written mostly in C++ today. So what is data parallel computing? The very simple view of data parallel computing is you have a data structure. And you have, you know, let's say some, mass, uh, some amount of data. And you can apply computation to different parts of your data structure in parallel, okay? And if you don't have this property, chances are your application will not be able to execute in parallel in any meaningful way. There are, you know, little ways that you can pipeline things a little bit, but even in pipelining, if your data is, uh, does not support parallel data uh, in the processing, your probably not going to get much out of, even out of your, uh, you know, your, what we call the, uh, you know, control pipelining either. So uh, here's a very simple example, and then you're actually going to be using this example in one of the, uh, I think it's MP4, uh, MP5. So uh, it's, you know, it, it has to do with how you, you know, convert your images from color image into uh, grayscale image. So um, it turns out that uh, this is an extremely parallel process because every pixel is defined in a color image with three values, R, G, and B, the basic color you know, uh, uh, components. And then you will create a chromatic value that would just you know, represent that pixel, and that pixel becomes a grayscale. Image. And um, in, in order to do this, you need to know a, a few more details, and um, uh, we're going to give you some of those details in MP. So the image is going to be represented in this uh, particular form in an array, okay? And um, then uh, you need to know which standard are, uh, would you be using for RGB representation. Every, uh, there are several standards, and the, uh, the one that we're using is going to be from Adobe. And uh, in general, the, all these standards are represented in a triangle, in a two-dimensional uh, you know, graph. And what, what are the two dimensions? The two dimensions are the coefficients for R, and, uh, and I think it's R and B, and then uh, uh, one of them, is, uh, so the, 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 the G component is just one minus the sum of the other two. So uh, the triangle gives you the representable values in that standard. So essentially, every pixel eventually will have X value, Y value, add up to you know, a value, and then you, uh, it will be less than one. So if you subtract one, uh, you know, uh, that value from one, you get the third component's weight. So the, depending on how you draw the triangle, it will give you different hues and different shades of red. You know, you can represent more red in this standard than some other standards, or you can represent more blue in this standard compared to other standards. But in the end, they are all some sort of triangles. And so what you, once you understand this, you have a formulation, then you can just convert the RGB weights into a single chromatic value, and that value gives you the, uh, the grayscale pixel. And all these things, all the pixels can be transformed in parallel. So you will be writing a fairly simple kernel to convert all the pixel values from the RGB weight representation into the chromatic value. Now, Let's begin to, you know, to talk about, you know, the, um, the very, very basic of, you know, creating threads, managing threads, feeding data to these threads, and so on in this lecture. So, you know, basically the pixels can be calculated independently of each other. So, uh, in the most simple, simplest possible way, we can just have one thread to convert one pixel 
right? And we can have many, many threads, as many threads as we have in the picture, right? In the, uh, in the image. So uh, we see that uh, we, we have, you know, input array, RGB value, output array, uh, chromatic, and then uh, you have all these, you know, the, uh, all, th all the threads will take three values and generate one value out of it. So this leads us to the uh, CUDA OpenCL execution model. CUDA and OpenCL have exactly the same execution model. They call things slightly differently uh, between these two models. And um, uh, the, so in both models, we have a, what we call the integrated host and device application C++ code, okay? So you, if you write a piece of code to execute in CUDA or OpenCL, you don't need to write a separate piece of code and, you know, for the host and separate piece of code for a device. You have a single program, but you have some keywords. You have some keywords that will tell you some of the code will be generated for the, uh, the host, some of the code will be generated by device, and some of the code will be generated for both, okay? So um, the concept is that you will start the execution on the host, and you have serial or mostly, you know, modestly parallel uh, code executing on the host. You can use OpenMP, you can use traditional host level threading, and uh, so you can have multiple of these host threads too. And each host thread can generate and can launch CUDA kernels, and that's how you start to get into massive amount of parallelism. And so whenever you have a highly parallel part in, the, uh, in your application, you can launch a kernel into your device, and the device will execute that code in the, a massive parallel way. So here we show the kind of the picture that you should keep in mind. You have a mostly serial code executing on the host, and then the host will, will call a, do a kernel call. And this is really your gateway into, par, into massive parallelism. You can think about it as kind of two universes, and serial universe and parallel universe, and you have a little bit of a gateway. Whenever you want to trigger some massive parallelism, you do a kernel call, and that kernel call triggers all kinds of things that, uh, you know, that manage and create that parallelism for you. So we call this kernel function kernel A, and then we give it two configuration parameters. And these two configuration parameters are in addition to the, the conventional arguments that you will provide to the functions. So these are CUDA-specific configuration parameters, and you have three less than signs and three greater than signs you know, that, that will you know, essentially uh, specify those two parameters. So what are the two parameters? Conceptually, the first parameter tells you how many thread blocks should be generated, and the second one will tell you, uh, you know, uh, how many threads in each thread block you will generate, okay? So uh, you're gonna generate these units called thread blocks, and the thread blocks can have anywhere between one and 1,024 threads, okay? And these thread blocks cannot be too big for reasons that you will become very clear to you very soon. So you can, you can generate these thread blocks. And then how many thread blocks you generate is that uh, first parameter, and how many threads are there in a thread block you can generate is the second parameter. Obviously, in this model, all the thread blocks will have the same threads. Okay, so this is the, you know, the first time that I'm talking about regularity now, okay? We're generating thread blocks that are all of the same number of threads. So this is, you know, a very regular execution pattern. If you ask me, how about, you know, if I don't want to use as many threads in some of the thread blocks as others, then you're looking at divergence. There are ways that you can, you know, can, can turn off threads. There are ways that you can do, you know, even do some dynamic parallelism and, you know, call, generate further thread blocks that are of, you know, different number of threads. And we'll, we'll go into some of those, you know, later on. But for now, think about all the thread blocks as regular, same number of threads. You can specify the number, but once you specify the number, it's specified for all the thread blocks, okay? So then, um, you know, after you finish the kernel, you can, you know, re, uh, the kernel returns and you execute the serial code, and then you get into another parallel, you know, phase, then you launch another kernel B, and with this time you can specify 
another different number of threads in the block and different number of thread blocks. So every time you do a kernel call, you have an opportunity to specify the number of threads in a thread block and the number of thread blocks. Okay? So let's uh, look at a very, very simple example. So uh, let's start with the thread that uh, what's going on in each thread. So in each thread, um, you know, we're go in, in uh, each thread is going to be executing uh, a code called uh, from the kernel function, and all the threads are going to be executing exactly the same function. So this is called SPMD or single program multiple data model. It turns out that you know the MPI has exactly the same paradigm. Okay, and so a uh, kernel when you provide that kernel function, uh, you are actually providing a piece of code that will be executed by all the threads when you do the kernel call, okay? All the threads in the grid. So the collection of all the thread blocks, each consists of multiple threads, the collection of them is called a grid, a grid of threads. The grid really refers to the universe of all the threads among all the thread blocks. And that's you know how we collectively call these threads, and um, so all the threads in the grid will run the same kernel code, and each thread has an index that it uses to compute memory addresses and make control decisions. Think about the thread index as the jersey number, okay, in these team uh, sports, okay. So every player has a jersey number, and then so you know the jersey number distinguish among uh, the players. So when we look into a thread block, a single thread block, within the thread block, we're going to have every thread to use the thread index to do you know, a unique part. For example, each thread may need to access a different part of an array. So obviously, we can calculate the array access index based on the thread index. Right? Then every thread will end up accessing a different part of the array. So uh, you can think about this system as a telephone number, and um, uh, so you know, for those of you who you know uh, who, who carry cell phone, you know, you you pretty much always use the entire phone number. So the area code for Champagne is two one seven, and then uh, you have the local phone number, and the university has you know several you know phone numbers like two four four three three three. And then you have the, the very local number. So the US phone number system is a three-tier system. And we can think about the area code. And then uh, they call the local number. But it's really there are two levels in, 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 inside that, right? So you know what? The, you can think about the thread index as your local number. And then you can think about the block index as the area code. And together, it should give you a unique number for the US, right? And here, together, if you take the thread index and the block index that we'll introduce later, together they should give you a unique number within that entire grid. Okay, so that's really that's exactly the uh, you know, the correspondence. So now, if we look at multiple thread blocks, we're going to uh, have every thread will also have an access to its block ID or block IDX, block index. So all the threads in the same thread block will share the same thread uh, block index value. So all the, you know, in this case, we have 256 threads in a thread block. And all the 256 threads in that thread block will have exactly the, the same thread block ID, which is the block IDX dot X. Block IDX dot X Thread IDX dot X are what we call the uh, pre, uh, predefined variables in CUDA. These are not the variables you declare. These are the variables that are given to you. Okay? You can just access these variables. And these variables will give you your block index and your thread index. And those values can be used to calculate memory access pointer values in array indices and make control decisions. Yes? This is always bothered me when I've been coming into that. Yeah. So it's dot x because that has a div entity, Yeah, yeah. So does, I don't understand what the value of the y and z is that I mentioned. Ah, OK. So uh, the question is, 
um, you know, uh, when you look at the, uh, the CUDA, you know, so we have this uh, block IDX dot X. So obviously, you will be expecting, uh, you know, block IDX dot Y and block IDX dot Z. So why in the world did these people define the Y and Z, which is, will be the uh, next two slides? Okay. So, um, so here, for the one-dimensional case, we're, uh, we're going to stay with the dot X. And so for all the threads in the first thread block, because their block index is going to be all zero, so there, when we form an i value dot out of block idx dot x times block <coughs> dim dot x, block dim dot x is yet another predefined variable. It tells you when the host code called the kernel and launched your grid, how many threads did the, uh, that host code tell you to have for every thread block, right? So that value gets remembered in this block dim dot x variable. So in this case, that block dim dot x will have 256, okay? And it depends on how the threads were created through that kernel call, right? The configuration. Now, so here, Block index dot uh, x will be zero for that for the first thread block, and block dim dot x will be 256. So the first term will be zero. So the i value for all the threads from zero to 255 will be just zero through 255. Okay. Next one, because block index is one, then uh, we still have block dim 256. So everything i value in the block one will be from 256 to 511. Essentially, you add 256 to their thread indices. So this is how you form a unique I value, unique I value across all the threads in your grid. Okay, yes? Is there a dimension bounded by the uh, bandwidth of the NAND chip? Or ah, okay. So the dimension, uh, what, how, are, uh, how are these dimensions bounded? So uh, basically what happens here, uh, there, there are two things going on. The block dim value itself is the maximum, bounded by the maximal value uh, of the, you know, allowed for each thread block, right? The maximum number of threads allowed for each thread block. So that's 1,024. That has to do with how people build these, you know, the processors and the resources that you need to provide to each thread block. And I will definitely go into that in more detail. And the second one is, you know what, um, X, Y, and Z, right? So, so, um, so for example, uh, when you have a block index dot X, the block index dot X, when you launch a grid, you, you have a limitation. For each dimension, you can only launch up to six, uh, six, 64K, you know, in each dimension in terms of the number of thread blocks, okay? That's a big number if you uh, multiply by three dimensions, that's a huge number. And that actually has more to do with uh, addressing and you know, some of the, the hardware limitations. So these things are all kind of limited by hardware limitations, and some of these things are actually increasing in terms of you know, what the, uh, what's allowed to do because the technology is getting better, so you're, you can provide more and more resources. We'll, we'll actually go into some of these uh, points uh, uh, later in the semester. So, so here, essentially, you know, if we want to cover a thousand and, let's say a thousand um, elements using this piece of code, then we're going to be launching a thousand and twenty-four threads. Because every thread block has to be 256, right? So the integer number of thread blocks we need to create in order to cover a thousand is going to be a thousand and twenty-four. You need to have the next uh, multiple of 256 that is just big, big enough to cover all the thousand. So all the 200, and, so the first, thread, there will be four thread blocks here, okay? You, you'll be launching four thread blocks and every thread block will be 256. All the threads, in, so the, the first thread block will cover zero through 255. The second thread block will cover 256 through 511. And the third one will cover from 512 to 767, I believe. And then the next one will be 600 and, uh, 768 through 1, uh, 999, because we're 
going from 0 to 999, the 1,000 elements. For those of you who are used to Fortran, um, you know, just subtract one in your indices, and you will be OK in the C world. And um, so uh, then we will have the last thread block will have a little bit of divergence, because 24 of the threads in that thread block will have nothing to do when we only need to process 1,000. So that's the, f the first experience of divergence you're going to have. And we're going to actually talk about the consequences. This goes back to the question that was asked earlier. For block index and thread index, and consequently, block DIN also, each thread can use these indices to decide that, uh, you know, which, what data to work on. And we will have not only block idx.x, but we're also going to have block idx.y and .z, because we oftentimes can use these indices to access multi-dimensional data structures. So for example, if you have a two-dimensional matrix, and um, you want to be able to access matrix elements, it's much more convenient if you have the x and y so that you can map a two-dimensional uh, 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 grid to a two-dimensional data structure. Then you can manipulate the x dimension and y dimension access into your data structure in a much more logical way. You can actually linearize everything into one dimension. So, you know, so there's, it's not a requirement, but it makes your code a lot easier to read if you use these. And, um, you know, so, uh, for you know, for modern uh, applications, you know, basically for vectors we use two one dimension, matrices with two dimensions, and then tensors we use three dimensions. So that's why when you work on the final project, you're going to see tensor code because uh, you know your your neural nets and so on are going to be represented with uh, you know input feature maps and output feature maps and weights, and all these things are actually in four to five dimension tensors in your you know in your application. So you, know, you will start to see that even three dimensions may not be good enough. So we are actually going to, you're going to see you'll, be, you'll need to fold one or two, or two or more of the dimensions in your data structure into one dimension, one of the dimensions of your thread indices. So this, you know, the, the, then you will start to appreciate, hey, you know what, uh, being able to just have each dimension correspond to a dimension of data structure is actually quite nice. Okay? So that's kind of the quick question, uh, answer to your question. So um, let's write a piece of code that will process, uh, will do vector addition. So we'll read two input vectors, vector A and vector B, and uh, we'll generate the output vector C, and the output vector C elements are just pairwise, pairwise uh, you know, additions of the uh, element uh, vector A and vector B. So all the elements can be produced in parallel and they're independent of each other. So we're going to launch a thread grid, one dimensional thread grid, okay? And with enough elements to be able to, you know, to, to, uh, to, uh, with enough threads to be able to cover all the elements. And uh, we're going to be, you know, uh, writing that piece of code. So before we write that piece of code, you know what, the, we always show, you know, how the traditional C code might look like. So in the main program, um, you, uh, you may you, you know, do memory allocation for A, B, and C, and then we call them uh, 8 underscore H just to, t to remind you that these are on the host, you know, on the host uh, CPU. And then uh, I.O. will read, you know, A, B, uh, you know, N element, you know, uh, N elements into A and B, and then you call a vector addition function. The vector addition function is so important that uh, we actually have libraries <laughs> doing these kind of things. So uh, these are called the, uh, the linear algebra library uh, functions. So uh, you know what the blocks. So basic linear algebra, uh, you know, the uh, uh, functions. So uh, these are the, uh, you know, so you can call the vector add, and there's a funny name to it, and I'm not going to use the funny name here, but um, uh, you can even write your own, you know, vector addition function. So uh, you know, the vector addition function will take a pointer to the beginning of a a pointer to the beginning of B, and then you do a loop. You take a, a little loop, and uh, in every iteration of the loop, you will take one element of A, one element of B, add it, add them together, and then generate one element of C. Once you iterate through all the elements, you're done, right? So that's a very simple sequential code. 
when we do the same computation in CUDA, we're going to have a outsourcing model where the uh, vector addition function is no longer doing that computation, but the uh, vector addition function is actually going to supervise a outsourcing activity. So basically what uh, it's going to do is it's going to allocate device memory for A, B, and C. Okay? So it's going to say the GPU is going to do the work. Okay? I'm not going to do the work. So I'm going to tell the GPU to allocate memory for A and B and C. And then I'm going to copy A and B to the device memory. I'm going to say, hey, you know, I'm not going to work on this. I'm going to just copy the data to you, and you do the work. Okay? And uh, then you do the, launch the kernel to process A and B and generate C. And after you're done with the kernel, you will copy C back. Okay, you copy C back into the, uh, in, into the host memory. So as far as the, the, the rest of the host code is concerned, the host code cannot tell whether that data was generated by the, the original host function or it was outsourced to a GPU function. This is a very, very primitive way of using the GPU. In fact, if you do some calculation, you'll realize that this way of using the GPU will slow down your vector addition, by the way. There's no increase of performance because the overhead involved in copying A and B to the, to the, the device and then copying C back is going to be actually longer than the, the compute itself. However, we don't always just do this kind of stuff. We're going to actually copy the data into the GPU, and then you will do a whole bunch of things and, you know, before you come back. For example, inferencing and machine learning and solving uh, differential equations, that will make the data copying much, much more worth it. If every vector addition involves this data copying, you know, the, then it's, it's just going to be bad. Okay. So, let's kind of, you know, now let's look at how we're going to tell the GPU to allocate memory for A, B, and C. And uh, uh, this goes into a, the first time you're going to see what we call the memory architecture or memory model of the uh, CUDA uh, GPUs or CUDA devices. So, uh, the device code can actually read, write, per thread registers. So uh, these are the uh, very, very fast registers in the, in the GPU hardware, and they're very similar to the CPU registers. Okay, so for those of you who have done assembly programming, you will know that these registers can be accessed as part of each instruction, and then uh, you know, there's essentially very little cost in accessing these uh, uh, registers. However, you, you know, the number of registers is quite limited. Okay, and um, uh, so uh, we're going to see some register variables in the code, and also we're going to be able to, every thread is going to be able to read, write per grid global memory, global memory. So uh, the, there's a global memory, and all the threads can read and write that global memory. So this is a shared memory parallel programming model. Okay, the threads have shared, share a single memory space. They can read, write into, uh, you know, the, this uh, shared memory space. The host code can transfer data to and from uh, the global memory, and um, so uh, we will, you know, cover more of the memory types later on. Okay, so you uh, you probably heard of uh, terms like shear memory, constant memory, texture memory. Some of them we will cover, some of them we will not. But uh, this is only a partial view of the types of memory you're going to be able to see in a GPU. Why is it important? This goes back to the memory bandwidth. So the compute is so fast on these devices that we really want to have a very large, a very high memory access, data access bandwidth. So, you know, we need to have all these different types of data to be able to provide that bandwidth. Techn technologically, we cannot just use a DDR to be able to provide that kind of bandwidth. So, you know, we're going to go through some calculation and you're going to see, you know, how important it is, you know, as we uh, get into the semester. So, for CUDA, Remember, we wanted to allocate memory. The host code wants, uh, wants to be able to say, GPU, allocate memory for A, allocate memory for B, and allocate memory for C. So uh, we have a CUDA malloc, uh, 
And the CUDA malloc will allocate objects in the device global memory, and it takes two parameters. The first one is the address of a pointer to the allocated object. This goes to one of the most confusing parts of, CUDA, of C programming. Okay? Remember, when you learn scanf, you need to provide the, point, the address of a pointer, pointer to a pointer, rather than the pointer itself. Right? And um, so, you know, the, so, uh, so you need to, you know, here for the uh, memory, it's exactly the same thing. You're providing a pointer that will end up pointing to the allocated location. So the allocator needs to change that pointer value. The allocator needs to put the beginning address of your object allocated in the, the GPU. You need to put that address into that pointer. So you need to give it the address of the pointer, not the pointer value itself. Okay? So this is the reason why, you know, um, in ECE 220, we spent so much time talking about pointers. And half of the professional programmers out there have no idea what the differences are, still, even today. Okay? And um, so you also need to provide the size of the allocated object in terms of bytes. Okay, this is a low-level, uh, you know, the API, where the amount of memory you allocate is going to be in terms of bytes. Each single precision floating point is four bytes. Okay, and you don't have to remember this. You can just say size of float. Okay, and um, each, you know, single each uh, integer value on the GPU is also four bytes. You can say size int. But you need to multiply the number of elements by the size of the data type, okay, to give you a total number of bytes. So, providing these two parameters, you will be able to allocate a you know chunk of memory for A, chunk of memory for B, and you have the pointer that you can use to uh, access those uh, values on the GPU. You also need to do CUDA free, just like any other. Uh, programming environment, if you don't free your memory, eventually you have something called memory leak, and you're going to end up in a situation where you don't have any more memory available for your application. And then, so you, if, if you access, if you uh, execute CUDA free, you need to provide the pointer to the object that you want to free the space, right? So that, that's why you provide the pointer value, not the address to the pointer. Because all the, all this, you know, the free function needs to do is just to access the object and put it into the free pool without changing the pointer value. Okay, so that's allocating memory. Just like you know, um, in C and so on, you also have a, a memory copy instruction called CUDA main copy. And this is a memory uh, data transfer function. It requires four parameters. Um, the first one is pointed to the destination. And the second one is pointed to the source, so you need to know where you're copying from, where copying, actually where you're copying to, and where you're copying from, the number of bytes you need to copy, okay, and the direction, whether you're doing this way or this way between the host and device. It turns out that for the later CUDA uh, versions, you no longer need to provide the type direction of the transfer. However, this is a good practice because it reminds you <laughs> which direction you're doing, you're, you're doing the transfer, okay? So, so let's look at the piece of the code once we understand these API functions. So in the host code, remember this is still in the host, okay? This is still in the host code. In order to, uh, to, to allocate memory and transfer A and B to device memory, we're gonna call CUDA malloc A, and A is a pointer that you, uh, you declare in the host code. That AD, right? The floating point pointer AD. And you're going to provide the address, n percent, the address of that pointer to the malloc for exactly the reason I just talked about. And then you need to provide the size, and the size is n element times the size of float. Some of you will just use n in your MP. And I'm going to see them, okay? It's going to be embarrassing to you, and I'm going to see everyone. So, you know, we're going to you know, go through all your code and take a check on everyone who use n rather than n times size of in your MP1, okay? Yes. <laughs> 
Yes, absolutely. PCIE. Lecture 26. OK. So um, it's going to be a little bit later, because uh, there, there's a reason why we delay it. OK. So CUDA malloc, so the, you know, B, D, uh, N percent D, and then you do the CUDA main copy. We also need to allocate C. So CUDA malloc C. But you notice that there's no copy to C, because C is produced by the GPU. You don't need to copy data in, right? And then you do the kernel invocation. And after the kernel, we're going to talk about that in several slides. After the kernel invocation, you're going to do the transfer of data back from GPU to the, the CPU. So the destination is going to be the CPU version, and the source is going to be the GPU version size, and the direction is CUDA main copy device to host. For, that, for now, you only need to know two of these symbolic constants. CUDA main copy host to device, and CUDA main copy device to host. You only need to know these two. There are multiple other things for various other reasons, but you don't have to worry about it for now. Okay? So after you finish, you can free A, B, and C on the device. Uh, let me say it one more time. All this code is executed on the CPU. Okay? All this code is executed on the, on the host. And this is why it's called an API. It's the functions that a, C, a traditional application can call from the CPU, on the CPU. And these are actually driver functions. Okay? NVIDIA wrote all these functions as part of their driver on the CPU. And the efficiency of these functions can vary dramatically from architecture to architecture. Even though you may be using, let's say, an ARM system with an NVIDIA GPU, which is called Tegra. Okay? Or you can use x86 systems with NVIDIA GPUs, which are most of the, you know, the kind of the servers today, or the PCs. Or you can use IBM Power CPU with NVIDIA CPUs. It's called the Power A and Power 9. NVLink based systems. You have to remember, when you use any of these systems, you will be calling these API functions on the CPU. And the implementation of these data transfers and memory allocation functions can actually vary. The quality can vary between ARM and x86 and IBM. So it's not because you're using NVIDIA GPUs, you should be getting exactly the same performance the total performance of your application will depend on the quality of the API function implementation or driver function implementation on these different architectures. So this is yet another quick thing about architecture that we need to make sure you understand when you do this kind of programming. Okay? Now, let's go into the, uh, the, the kind of the meat of today's lecture, which is the, the kernel code. How do you create a kernel function? And how do you call that kernel function? So here, I'm showing you the vector addition kernel code. So uh, the kernel code, just like any other function, will take input arguments. So it needs to know where to find A, where to find B, where to find C. These things are all pre-allocated by the host code. Remember, the host code call all those API functions? So those pointers have been initialized by the API functions before the kernel call. So those pointers are provided to this kernel right here. So it knows how to find A, B, and C. It also knows the number of elements that need to be processed for the vector addition. Okay? Now, when you go into the, the function, the first thing you do in this function is to form that unique I index. So the unique I index allows every thread to go into a unique position, right? Unique position and cover all the elements. Every thread will find one, okay? And then every, all the threads together cover all the elements. So that's why it's important to generate that I systematically with block idx.x times block dim.x. You have first 256, remember that example? And then the next 256, and so on. They're all systematically covered, right? And then you will test. 
whether i is less than the number of elements. Because remember, you will, we will be creating thread blocks that are in the multiples of the thread block sizes, and the last thread block will likely have some threads who, are, who would be beyond the vector boundary, right? And you don't want those threads to go and access A and B, which do not exist, and try to write a C that does not exist. The lowly GPUs, even though they are a little bit less you know, sophisticated operating systems and so on, if you try to write into a location that does not exist, they still cause an exception. They still will vomit and do a core dump and they'll kick you out. Okay, so you don't want that to happen. Yes? Yeah. 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 So, so the, the question is, is, since you're doing this test, in the last thread block, you're going to have, you know, essentially 200 and, uh, 220, 256, uh, uh, subtract 220, uh, uh, subtract 24, so it's uh, uh, 222 threads that are, you know, uh, that will be within, right? And then 24 will be outside. So that's exactly the divergence. And I'll actually spend quite a bit of time talking about that. Yes. Ah, the shared memory is actually going to come up uh, when we start to talk about data reuse. Um, this particular piece of code does not have data reuse. Every data element will be touched exactly once. But would you okay. expect us to like, uh, push whatever the i larger yeah. than n to like, the other? No, not yet, no. Not, not for that reason. So uh, you know, I didn't repeat that question, but uh, you know, so, uh, but I will. Uh, I would just tell you uh, not to worry about it for now, okay? So the vector addition function now becomes the outsourcing. Remember, we already talked about the call to the CUDA main, main, main lock and CUDA main copy. So I'm not going to repeat that. The, the, those are still going to be there, right? So, but uh, I'm not going to repeat them. The most important part is that kernel launch that I did not talk about in the previous slide. So this is where it is. So we're going to launch the kernel back. Uh, calling the vec at kernel. So that's exactly the vec uh, at kernel. In order for the kernel function to be able to serve as a kernel function, you need to precede that kernel function with a underscore, underscore, global, underscore, underscore, on top, right there. In fact, I should have done this. So, so this keyword has two underscores in front and two underscores in the back, okay? This is a keyword that tells the compiler this is a very unique, a very important function. Okay, this function will be launched with a configuration, okay, with configuration parameters, and it will be launched, be launched with threads, multiple threads on the GPU. Okay, so for this, in fact, uh, you're going to see a few other things here. So for the, when we call the vector addition kernel. We're going to need to tell the kernel to tell the GPU to execute 200 and you know, some number of threads in the uh, in the thread block and the number of thread blocks. So this at this point is somewhat arbitrary. I just picked 256 to make it more interesting. You can pick anything between one and 1,024. It will work. Some of them will execute pretty slowly, but they will all work. In fact, that's something you should try. Okay, when you do the exercise, you should play with some of these things, just, you know, just to see how, what happens. Yes? I was just going to say, like, um, we talked about the if statement earlier, so I was wondering why we didn't pick 250 as it, but I understand the efficiency of what would be less. Yeah, okay. I'm just curious as to what yeah. trade-off Yes, yes. Okay, the, the, uh, the question is, um, you know, in that slide, we had 256. Why not pick uh, 250? Why not pick 248? You know, what, uh, if it is, you know, nine, if we're processing 990-some elements, right? So uh, there is a penalty for using a thread block uh, size that is not a multiple of 32. Okay, there is a penalty. Not huge, but there is a penalty. And you will be underutilizing hardware. So that's why, in general, as a rule of thumb, you should use multiples of 32 
two of the powers in general more convenient, okay? But um, you know, but multiple of 32 is more important. But here, you know what? The, we, we're not going into these things yet. So you know, that's why I'm telling you, you can pick anything you want, as long as whatever value that you put into that 256 position, you also adjust the denominator when you pro uh, produce the number of thread blocks to make sure that you, 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 you always have the right number of thread blocks. As long as you adjust both the uh, inconsistent way, it should just work. Okay, yes? Does the amount of blocks you generate affect performance or no? Is, does the number of blocks you generate affect performance? Uh, slightly. For this kind of application, because every thread, uh, you know, every thread does so little, when you generate a lot of thread blocks, there is a little bit of overhead in generating thread blocks. So you will be slightly slower. But give it a try. Yeah. Perfectly legitimate question. Try it. Yeah. It, it, it might be slightly faster. Yes. Wouldn't that depend on the kind of logic that the user code would write? If you have a lot of contextual logic, you want to run more blocks. Yeah. So the, wouldn't, wouldn't the number of blocks and the number of threads in a block uh, be somewhat determined by the context of your application and some of your data structure usage? Absolutely. Because, uh, you know, the, but on the other hand, this is actually one area where the programmers have significant um, you know, latitude in terms of tuning. Okay, and um, you know, there's also a concept called the uh, uh, you know, threat coarsening. So you know what? The, for for various reasons. So you know, you know this is intentionally left. The NVIDIA designers intentionally let left, left this as a, a you know, truly tunable parameter, so that they can give you the freedom where you need to accommodate other needs that will, you know, force you to do more things in a thread and so on, okay? Now, so this is the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the launch statement for the kernel. And you can actually launch the kernel in many, other, many, many ways. The previous slide showed that uh, we do a ceiling function of n divided by 256.0. Historically, about one third of you will trip, trip on this error if I didn't talk about it. In C, when you divide n by, let, n is an integer, if you divide it by 256, C is a automatically truncated uh, you know, the division uh, model. So anything that has a, uh, that has a fractional out outcome will be just truncated. So if I divided, a thousand and twenty, uh, a thousand by two hundred and fifty-six. I'm not going to get four. Okay, I'm going to get three point something. Right, and three point something will become three in C. So that's why we use two hundred and fifty-six dot zero in this particular case. This is one way to ensure that you receive a fractional outcome, and then you use the ceiling function to ramp it up to four if necessary. Okay, you can do exactly the same thing with this co-sequence, and people people prefer to do one way or the other. So you know, there's no reason why you have to do one way or the other. On the CPU, this piece of code should be slightly faster, so you will have you know dim grid n divided by 20, uh, 256. Remember that we'll get three rather than three point something, right? But then you say if n and it has a, a modular 256 is not e equal to zero. That means that this function, uh, this value ha will generate a little bit of fraction, right? Then you will increment that grid, uh, the dim grid by one. This takes care of the corner case, where if you are exactly multiple, you should not increment by one, right? But if you are Anywhere other than exact multiple, you should increment by one. And this achieves exactly the same outcome as the 256.0 division and ceiling function. Yes? Instead of using 256.0, could you just use typecasting? Yes. You, you can, uh, so the question is, why don't you use typecasting? Yes. You can, uh, that actually is typecasting in the implicit C rule because uh, C has automatic casting. So when you use 256, you automatically trigger the casting. Yeah. So same same reason. 
Okay, so this gives us, you know, so you can assign um, you know, the, uh, the values into the multiple dimensions of the dim grid. So this is the C++ uh, assignment, right, into the, uh, the dim three uh, variables. So you can assign the meaningful ones in the x dimension, and then just use one for the y and z dimension that you're not using. And then you can provide those uh, dim three variables into the, into the configuration. So this is the most general way of specifying the kernel launch dimension, because this will give you full specification of the, all the three dimensions, and you just use one for the dimensions that you're not using. Yes, any, that's all question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How does the casting and conversion time affect uh, the GPU execution? If you do casting in the GPU, terrible. Okay. So the, the short answer is, uh, you know, try to do most of the casting on the CPU if you can. But you know, that's a secondary. It's usually a secondary because uh, the GPU can tolerate a lot of that latency. And um, but still, okay. Uh, so here is the summary. Here's a summary of what we talked about. And then you're going to be you know, the, the, doing exactly this in your MP1. So you have the host code, okay, the host code. And you can mark the host code with underscore, underscore, host, underscore, underscore, or you don't say anything. If you don't say anything, it defaults to host code. In the host code, you have, you set up the, the, the dimension uh, variables, and then you invoke the kernel. And obviously, you also need to do the mail locks and the, you know, the CUDA main copy. So on the device, you have this global, which defines back at kernel as a kernel function. And you have the, you know, the code that I already talked about, calculating a unique index and access the data structure using that index. So every thread will be accessing a different element. When you launch the kernel, you will be generating a number of thread blocks, in our example, four of those thread blocks. And then each thread block will have multiple threads, in our example, 256. When the kernel is, is launched, you actually, each thread will be executing this piece of code and gen generate a unique index. All these thread blocks will be scheduled into what we call the uh, you know, uh, streaming multiprocessors. Uh, we have not talked about that yet. Okay, in about four lectures, you will know everything in that picture. But for whenever, whenever you you launch that kernel in the real hardware, these thread blocks will be scheduled into uh, the streaming multiprocessors, and the streaming multiprocessors will be accessing random access memory to process the data. There's really no magic. Okay, these things are all. Very, in many ways, still very similar to your CPU world. It's just that it has a whole lot more parallelism. Yes? Sorry to keep asking questions. Last thing, would the multiprocessor be similar to the world of like CPU pipelines? OK. Uh, would the uh, multiprocessors be the uh, same performance CPU pipelines? No. Uh, they're actually designed very differently, but they're roughly equivalent to a CPU core. OK. So uh, this is something you, you should remember. When you declare your functions in your code, um, you can declare a function as device function, global function, or host function. Global function we already talked about. Global functions are kernels. They will be called on the host, but executed on the device, right? Called on the host and executed on the device. And the device function is actually something that you can call from the device, so your kernel can be calling some functions, as long as these are device functions. So this is just for software engineering, right? That you want to be able to call all kinds of functions. And so you uh, call on the device, execute on the device. You can have a host function that is called from the host and execute on the host. If you write a function that you have both host and device in front of it, it generates two versions of that function in the executable code. One can execute on the host, one can execute on the device. Okay, so this should bring us to the, code, the, the flow. You, you write your code, you give it to MVCC, and MVCC split it up into the host code that you can compile with GCC or Intel ICC or IBM 
compiler or ARM compiler. And then you can, uh, uh, the GPU part will be generated into PTX and compiled by the NVIDIA, NVC, uh, the NVIDIA compiler. So same source code, but with all the keywords, it will be sorted out into two parts. One will be on the host, one on the device. Okay? Good luck on that MP1. Okay?